Well, good evening and welcome to another Wednesday's Word. Uh, we're glad you're joined in with us today and we pray that uh, this devotion will be a blessing to you as we continue in the study of 1 Corinthians 13, Love in Action. Uh, as we've been mentioning before, these are characteristics that's mentioned in this chapter about how true love really looks like, how it acts, how it behaves. And it's so important for us to be able to look at those things so that we know if we're biblically loving others, whether it's a spouse, a child, co-worker, neighbor. We need to look at this list of these characteristics of how love behaves, how it acts, so that we have a checklist, so to speak, to see, hey, are we biblically loving? I know in our flesh, we always say, oh yes, we, we love others, but the Bible gives us these characteristics to really help us see if we love others, just like almost like a test. You know, you, you may think you're ready for the algebra test, but until you take the test, you're not. And many times we look over this list and see that we fall short in loving in some, some of these areas. And they remind us, it's a good reminder of ways that we can improve the way we love. Uh, isn't that how the world will see that we're Jesus' disciples, the way we love one another? So we ought to always be improving in love and how we love others. And so if you have your Bibles, we're continuing in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Uh, we've been looking at those characteristics of love. We've covered four so far in the series. Uh, love is patient. We covered love is kind. We covered love is not jealous. And we wrapped up the last time with love does not brag. And so uh, in this devotional, we're still in verse 4 of chapter 13. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. And we begin with a, a brand new one that talks about love is not arrogant. Love is not arrogant. Matter of fact, another version says it's not puffed up. Another version says, does not display itself haughtily. And so uh, we see that it doesn't have this arrogant attitude. If you were here Sunday or tuned online, uh, you saw where Pastor Joe had started a new series, In the End Times, and was going over these characteristics of people that are in the church, uh, in church and leaders, church leaders and church evangelists, people that are, that are associated as believers, or at least were, were in the church, that were displaying particular kind of behaviors. And uh, as, I was, as he was preaching on that, we read that list and he, he began preaching over it. Uh, I realized that that list is just really the opposite of this list. That in general, those characteristics are unloving. And these characteristics are loving. And matter of fact, this one was one that he, I believe it was almost the last one that he discussed of not of that they would be arrogant, but love is not arrogant. It, it doesn't, it's not prideful. And uh, we can look at how, you know, it's amazing that that one, one version says not puffed up. You know, we've heard about that people being full of hot air or full of themselves you know, that pride that, that just creeps in. You know, just uh, pride's at the heart of all sin. You know, we just just prideful and, and arrogant and, and puffed up. And, but true humility is not thinking about ourself. It's thinking about others. That and, and, and this term about humility was really coined by Christians because... It, it, that's something new where people would on their own want to, to humble themselves. You know, that that would be something we'd do. Now, some people get humbled, but, if, but just to think that you'd do it yourself, it'd be a choice you'd make, is something that was new to Christianity. And, uh, and so we can see that what a difference that makes because when we're arrogant, we, become, we can become very judgmental. And when we become judgmental, it sure doesn't lead to love. Listen to a few of these verses about the church at Corinth. Uh, again, we're in chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians. Listen to a few verses earlier on in that, uh, in that book. 
first, listen now kind of to the end of 1 Corinthians 4, 6. It says, so that no one of you will become arrogant in behalf of one against the other. First, listen how 1 Corinthians 4, 18 starts. Now some have become arrogant. Listen how 1 Corinthians 5, 2 starts. You have become arrogant. That was about the church that he's writing it to. So he's saying not to be arrogant because he already knew they were acting arrogant and to stop it. <laughs> because in this chapter, he's saying, because you can't love when you're arrogant because love is not that way. It doesn't have that attitude, doesn't have that action uh, to be able to do those things. And, you know, spiritual men, great men, they don't look so much they don't see themselves as important. They see other people as important. But pride, <laughs> it sees ourselves as the most important, uh, so necessary, and uh, fails to see other people and the needs of other people and the importance of other people. You know, we're just drowned in our own importance, and so we have to focus on that. You know, there was a pastor one time that. Uh, and again, uh, when we don't, uh, when we do focus on pride, sometimes we find out uh, it's kind of hard to swallow. Uh, there was a pastor one time that was asked to speak at a, a charitable organization, and he accepted an invitation, and he went to speak, and after he was finished, the chairman of the organization handed him a check for speaking, and he said, oh, I can't accept this. I'm just honored to have been asked to speak. Here, you use this for your organization. You know where to use it best. And the chairman says, well, I appreciate you giving that back. We're, how about us taking this check and putting it in our special fund? He said, that's fine with me. Where you think it's used best is good for me. But by the way, what is the special fund? And the chairman said, oh, the special fund, that's where we put money so that we can afford a better speaker for next year. You see, humility can come in shock uh, when we become prideful of who we are. And uh, the Lord has ways to, to bring humility in our life. And, and that's good because when we think less of ourselves and more of others, we can demonstrate the love that Christ showed while he was here. Uh, Proverbs makes it clear, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before stumbling. <laughs> Not only the warning about pride keeping us from loving correctly, it'll always bring destruction when it has its way. It'll always bring stumbling. And we can see when we look back at our life, the times when we did have destruction, many times when we did have stumbling, it's because we let pride cre creep in. Pride take over. You know, it was, it's, it's, at the heart of all sins, our pride, when we're putting ourselves first before the Lord or before others, and it demonstrates itself in, in destruction. Uh, the next one we want to look at is in verse 5. The next characteristic is love does not act unbecomingly. You think, well, what in the world is that? Well, another version said it's not rude. It's not rude. It, the word has to do with, the, you know, showing courtesy and hospitality and politeness. It's being a well-mannered person. Um, matter of fact, Bill Gothard um, says this in regard to this phrase. He says, it knows what is proper and when. What is proper and when? What's the proper thing to do at this time that would be well-mannered, polite, and thoughtful of other people. Uh, matter of fact, William Barclay says that uh, in his comment on this, love does not behave gracelessly. In other words, love is gracious. It's polite. Uh, matter of fact, the Greek word for grace and charm are really the same word. Uh, that being gracious is, is, is ha having to do with uh, what you show, the love you show toward other people. That, And here we're looking at polite and well-mannered. And what I want to discuss for a little while is, 
is some of the things that I believe that are good practical things that we do or should do or always be reminded to do that show well-mannered behavior and polite behavior. One is just a simple please, a simple thank you, that gratitude that we have for what other people do show love that we have for them. Because being grateful is a great uh, action word to show your love for others. Uh, excuse me. Being able to ask somebody just in a general gesture, hello, how are you doing? You know, I know that sounds just trite that we say that, but that's, that's part of, of just being well-mannered, uh, having a, a greeting. There's all greetings throughout all cultures, and we should be uh, always doing that, asking how people, how they are. Matter of fact, there was an elderly woman in a long line at the post office. And the postmaster there at that post office saw her in the in line and saw how, how old she was and kind of walked up to her man, what are you in line for? She said, I just need to get stamps. And uh, the postmaster said, hey, there's a machine right over here. All you have to do is put your coins in or your dollars and, in, and the machine will uh, dispense the stamps and you won't have to wait in line. She says, no. That machine won't be, won't be able to ask me, how's your arthritis doing, Miss Jones? How are those grandkids doing? She said, but when I wait up here at the front of this line, the gentleman that always waits on me always asks me those questions. You see people, some people may respond just with a general yes, but just to be asked and for to have the opportunity to say how they're doing is, is a gesture that we can do to show them love, sharing with others not interrupting, giving people up, giving up your chair so that somebody else can sit down. Opening the door for somebody is a good polite gesture. Uh, letting someone go before you in a line for eating. Listen to what was going on in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty one. For in your eating, each one takes his own supper first. <laughs> See, they weren't sharing, they weren't giving up their spot maybe in line, they weren't thinking of other people. They were thinking of themselves. Asking someone to sit with you who's sitting alone. Uh, I see people sometimes do that in, in church or church fellowships. Somebody sitting over there and say, hey, come sit with us. That's an action of love. To where you're not thinking, we're not thinking just about us, we're looking and thinking about someone else. A newcomer to church, a newcomer at a fellowship, Hey, why don't you come sit with us? I know with COVID and all these restrictions, there's a lot of issues in regard to that, but this is a way to, to demonstrate that kind of uh, a love. You know, children being able to say yes, sir, and no, sir, and uh, waiting on somebody else. You know, going up to get something for somebody that uh, needs some help. And just general hospitality. If you're familiar with Luke chapter 7, they're starting around verse 36, I believe. Uh, Simon, not Simon Peter, but Simon the Pharisee had invited Jesus over to his home for a dinner. And somehow during the dinner feast, a woman comes in and it says of her that she was from the city and she was a sinner. Because I know we're all sinners, but that description was there for a reason. Now we don't know that Possibly she was a prostitute. She was an adulterous woman. We, we don't know the full extent, but she had a bad reputation in the community. And Simon was being very judgmental of her, of the display that she was showing as she would, uh, was wiping Jesus' feet and uh, was, had her tears as they washed his feet. And he became judgmental of her, even judgmental of Jesus, that he would not even know if he's a prophet. He ought to know what kind of woman was there at his feet. And he goes, Jesus goes on to give a parable. I'm not here to give the whole story. That's a whole sermon of it and of itself. But let, let, me, uh, he, let me tell you what Jesus said at the end of that, that parable. And after he explained what that parable meant, he said, turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears 
and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but since the time I came in, she's not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she anointed my feet with perfume. What he was telling Simon, you didn't even operate in general, customary manners when I came to your house. It was, it was, it was good manners when people came to your home, like you would today maybe take their coat from them, is to wash their feet because people were in sandals and dirty feet and you'd wash their feet. A, a customary of that day kiss, a customary anointing the head with oil. They, he, he didn't do any of that. And Jesus was uh, rebuking him. The lady was doing it, but he didn't do it. And he ought to have known better being a Pharisee and, and, and having the scriptures in his mind and heart, supposed to, um, to not show that general politeness, that general customary manners that people should have for one another. And again, some of these things I mentioned, there was obviously more I could, but I believe we need to focus in on that, that love does not act unbecomingly. It's not rude. It has good and polite manners. The next one mentioned uh, after that, and we won't have time to discuss it at great length, but I just want to kind of wet your whistle for the next time, is that love does not seek its own. That kind of ties in the whole what we've even been saying, and we'll look into that in more detail because love seeks other people's own, uh, other people's interest and not our own. And so uh, I hope you are blessed by these uh, that we've discussed and be able to implement them in your life that your and my actions of love can improve and improve and improve till the day we go home to be with the Lord or the day he comes to get us that we'll always be improve, improving on the way that we show love toward others. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, pray that you'd bring these things to our remembrance. God, as we go about our day, interact with people, relatives, friends, neighbors, children, co-workers, Lord, that we can be reminded of these things that we've been learning to be able to love better. And God, that we would not only do it to, to love better, but Lord, that that's how the outside world will know you're, that we're your disciples, the way we love one another. So Father, we thank you for your word and ask for your strength and direction as we carry it out. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, praise the Lord. Just want to make a, a note I'd mentioned earlier in the devotional about the, the messages on Sunday. Uh, Sunday was great. Just a, was a great uh, time of ministry and fellowship and in the word and worship. Uh, as I mentioned, Brother Joe had started last Sunday uh, the message on in the end times. And it was a great message as he uh, looked at, began looking at those characteristics that I shared about uh, people, church leaders, people in the church and the way that uh, they would be uh, acting those characteristics that uh, they would display. And uh, you don't want to miss it. And a lot of people say, well, maybe end times, study the end times is not important. Well, it is important. Look how much was written in the Bible about end times. Um, just the sheer amount of information shows how important it is. How'd you like to write somebody a letter and they said, well, I read half of it, but the other half I didn't think was important enough to read. You say, well, if I wrote it, it was important. And, and the Bible has a lot to say about the end times. And you don't want to miss this life-changing sermon series. Uh, invite people. A lot of people are very interested in the end times. And maybe neighbors or coworkers, you can share with them what's being preached. And, and they'll come and be blessed uh, by our worship and the word. But uh, use that as an inviting tool to others. And uh, they'll be blessed and you'll be blessed by this sermon series. But just want to let you know. Uh, we love you. The pastors love you. Our church loves you. Praise the Lord for our church and the spirit of unity that's in our body, and we praise the Lord for that. Uh, praying for you. Love you. Here for you. And look forward to seeing you real soon. God bless you.